Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of the Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Berta Dotto, with my co host, Michael Bird. Michael, we're, we're going forward. Season 11, what's the theme? As a business and healthcare law firm, we meet a lot of interesting people and learn their amazing stories. This season's theme is hard conversations. We will take real client stories, and of course, Brad, we're going to scrub the names to protect confidentiality. Good idea. We'll take these stories built around confronting and having hard conversations. They don't all have great outcomes, nope. but there are plenty of teachable moments. Well, before we kind of dive into opening up the season 11, Michael, I want to ask you a question. Have you heard the HBO series From Earth to the Moon? Uh no, sounds a little nerdy, Brad. <laughs> all right, fine. What about the Apple TV Plus TV series for all my, for all mankind? I'm, my context brain is exploding right now because you've just said two names. I don't know what you're talking about and why you're talking about it. So please share. I think you knew I wouldn't know what you were talking about. Well, you know, I'd have never know. You you like you watched some shows, all right. Both of these series tell a story of the United States space program from the beginning in 1961 and going towards the moon. The Earth to the Moon series focused on real events from 1961 all the way to the final moon mission in 1972. Um, it was really well written, really well acted. Uh, Tom Hanks was one of the executive producers, and he narrated the beginning of every single segment. Lots of fun watching it with my kids. They all loved it. It still stands up. For all mankind starts off with the American – the Americans are unable to actually land on the moon first, and Russia gets there first on the moon, and it basically has this weird timeline where all of a sudden now there's a space race of trying to gobble up the moon and, and Russia versus America on the moon. It's a it's, it's really interesting uh, story because it's what, – what would happen if – the Russians got there first. Yeah, that's. I think I actually, as you were talking about, I've heard of that. Isn't isn't there like this play out of the next many years yes. of what would have happened? Yes. And is it? I'm guessing it's not good for us as Americans. Well, I don't want to spoil it. Oh, okay. Maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe yeah. maybe there's something to celebrate there. I don't know. But I have a feeling it's not good. Anyway, so what does this you know moon talk have to do with today? Well, so. It it's a it, it appears we're heading back. We real time America is heading back to the moon again on November sixteenth. For those who weren't paying attention, who aren't a little NASA nerds like me, NASA launched launched another uncrewed um, uh, spaceship, um, Artemis One um, or Orion, to from Florida to the moon, and it launched on the most powerful rocket ever, which is on a space launch system mega rocket. For those who don't know, apparently a mega rocket is more powerful than a regular rocket, but I just mm. love the fact that they call it a mega rocket. This mission is kicking off nearly a month-long journey for, from Earth to the moon, and uh, if everything shakes out well, um, this when Orion um, is going to capture a whole bunch of good data points and, and milestones that we're heading back towards the moon. Wow, I feel like we need to cue the, the eagle screeching music in the background. <laughs> yes, and for those who don't know, Orion did get at the moon. It rotated around the moon um, between November 25th and December 1st, headed back to Earth, and um, after a long burn, it arrived back to Earth on December 11th, 2022, splashing down softly under parachutes uh, about 100 miles outside of Mexico on uh, the Baja Peninsula. Did I see or hear that that Elon also going to the moon? Yes, he oh. actually but that's a privatized one that 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 he's building something separate that might be for what we're about to talk about is that this mission that we're kicking off here is NASA doing it and they're what they're hoping to do is be able to build a research base in the south polar region of the moon where they believe ho has frozen water, which obviously is something they need uh, for sustaining life there. And that next – they have another launch coming up in 2023 in which they are hoping to have astronauts orbit the moon and then they'll come back and eventually send, uh, send man back to the moon. Um, and during that same time, this may be where Elon comes in. They're trying to build a space station that's going to be orbiting the moon called Gateway so they have a jumping off point to uh, have – astronauts dock there at the the, the at that place and go up and down. 
So he's not just doing that to escape the heat from Twitter? <laughs> okay. I don't know. I, I, I can't answer that question. Well, it sounded really scientific yes. and purposeful yes. what, the way you described it. Uh, well, so what is what – is, how does this connect to today's episode? Well, if you watch these series, you'll know one thing that NASA tries to do is they, they try to find ways to minimize the risk to their, their greatest ast- – at their astronauts are their greatest assets before sending them to space. So um, much less than, you know, if you're sending someone to the moon and there's a catastrophic of failure, it, it does not end well generally for those astronauts. And um, although today's story has nothing to do with traveling in the moon, it does have to do with understanding ways in which we as attorneys work with our clients and trying to find ways to minimize their risks to help prevent catastrophic failures. So you're basically trying to correlate yourself as an attorney to NASA. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a good – yeah. thank you for finally noticing. It seems fair, yes. <laughs> <laughs> today's today's story is going to sound, Brad, a lot like last week's story. So we kind of have to give that uh, – if you have that deja vu feeling audience, just know, stick with us because there's a really important uh, deviation mm. in how it plays out and and – how the hard conversation moment was handled. And we'll also explore the legal implications from a slightly different angle than last week and really focus more about non-compete enforcement. Yeah. So, Michael, today's story, since we're scrubbing the names, our client in the story will call him Dr. Homecoming. Um, well, let me guess that Dr. Homecoming is headed home. Oh, my God, Michael, you're crushing it. Uh, I think you're only one for one. It's probably the best you'll get all day. But, yes, you're correct. Dr. Homecoming is an orthopedic surgeon who is ready to move back to his hometown, which, um, which, which is an area inside the, the Long Island area. He lived in a small town there. And Dr. Homecoming's wife was also from the Long Island area, and both their parents were living in Long Island. And so Dr. Homecoming had a, um, had a great offer from a very large multi-specialty group with offices mostly across the New York area, and but several across the Long Island. And, um, and we'll just call Dr. Uh, Homecoming's employer New York Clinic. Very original, Brad, with <laughs> your names. <laughs> so the this hometown plan A does sound a lot like Dr. Roger from last week. Mm-hmm. And as we discussed last week, the plan A is being able to identify identify your vision for your career. You know, what are you going to do when you grow up? Mm-hmm. What does it look like five years from now if this goes according to plan? Your career being this, if your career goes according to plan, and that will help you prioritize your current opportunities. And then plan B is what are you going to do if something goes wrong? What's your contingency plan? Okay. I'm glad you're paying attention since you were part of the podcast last week. Yes, much like last week's show on Dr. Uh, Roger, um, um, D- Dr. Homecoming hired us on the front end to assist with the, the analysis of the employment agreement. Okay. Well, what did you learn? It was actually a pretty good contract as it relates to the compensation. Um, they were assisting with the moving costs and other benefits um, that were great for Dr. Homecoming. Because uh, he was just finishing up his fellowship at Ohio in, in Ohio, and generally speaking, um, you know the New York Clinic employment was mostly a reasonable agreement. Um, mostly reasonable uh, sounds sounds like a subtle issue there, Brad. <laughs> yes, you kind of hinted to about that in the beginning. This the non compete was extremely aggressive. It had a 24-month, 10-mile radius of every clinic, ASC, and hospital that the New York Clinic provided medical services. And as a reminder, this was a huge group. And on Long Island, they had seven uh, office locations and had privileges at over a dozen hospitals and ASCs. Yeah, and this is actually a great example of how you actually got to really read a non-compete to see just how expansive it is because – just on its surface, if you saw that a non-compete was for two years and 10-mile radius, you'd be like, oh, well, that's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. But the fact that this New York clinic ha- covered so much area and they had the non-compete com- com- connected to every single office location, mm-hmm. the net impact was uh, uh, massive. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so – I know if I were the audience, I'd be saying, okay, is this even legal? Mm-hmm. And uh, and let's talk a little bit more about that on the second, you know, kind of part of the show. And, uh, and but let's definitely acknowledge that that's a lot of locations that would block him from 
pretty much all of Long Island. Yeah, the, you nailed it, Michael. That's pretty good. It's like maybe you are two for two today. Um, yes, and, and and based on that ten mile radius, the group basically blocked out the entire length of Long Island with only a few small fractional areas that were outside of the radius. Oh man, I hurt, strained my shoulder, patting myself on the back. <laughs> um, what happened next? Well, we spent a lot of time discussing uh, uh, Doctor Homecoming need to be back at Long Island. We talked about ways to minimize this ten mile radius. And and we talked about the, the pros and cons of this contract and understanding what a huge risk, and especially like the fact that he and his wife are basically moving home. Yeah, I mean, it's part of his plan A. It's yeah. the most important part of his plan A. It's a plan A, you know, it's a huge deal if you don't have a plan B that would allow you to carry forward. So tell me tell me more. Yeah. So first, you know, we talked about going and having these conversations with the group, you know, or let's talk about ways to overall just e- decrease the 10 mile radius to lower that number. Mm-hmm. Um, we additionally discussed is, is there limiting the actual locations where Dr. Homer actually was providing medical service versus every single place that, that the doctor, the New York clinic provided service and finally, you know, locations where basically that's he exclusively or uh, p- provide services. So there are a lot of different things that we start addressing, and I know there are other options they might have too. Yeah, I mean, those are great ideas for, you know, for Dr. Homecoming to prepare him for this hard conversation mm-hmm. and, and some other things that we've done, you know, in, in these types of situations is we'll try to negotiate a buyout provision mm-hmm. so that they can there's a financial penalty or cost but you can buy out of the non-compete or sometimes we'll be able to negotiate or try to negotiate that the non-compete only applies if the physician leaves without cause. Uh, with it, as I said, I mean, with this being Dr. Homecoming's plan a, uh, it really makes sense to press in on this issue and mm-hmm. get creative and, uh, and really, really make sure that this is the, one of the issues that gets addressed. One of yep. the, mo- the only issues that gets addressed probably, but, did Dr. Homecoming have a hard conversation with the New York, uh, the NY clinic to attempt to modify the employment agreement? And uh, and if so, how did it go? Michael, I don't know. Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, can I go back a season or two and ding you? No, no. Oh. The red flag season says no, you, that you cannot use the ding button anymore. Okay. But fair point to ding. Um, Dr. Homecoming thanked me for my thoughts. And several days later, I randomly just looked at my inbox and there was an email confirming that he had agreed to the employment agreement with the New York Clinic. Well, that seems kind of like an anticlimactic story. How can we even talk about hard conversations when you don't even know if he had the one you discussed him having or the outcome of the conversation? Well, Michael, hold on to your hat because 10 months later, I get a frantic call from Dr. Homecoming. Uh The New York Clinic has set an immediate termination notice um, to Dr. Homecoming. And in this notice, it states that they plan to terminate him for cause or he could accept some separation agreement and resign without cause if Dr. Homecoming agrees to waive any and all claims against the New York Clinic. And if they do this, they'll continue to compensate him for 90 days, but he's out. Well, that's bad, but at least Dr. Homecoming can be compensated for a short period of time. What about the non-compete? Did you learn if he had had the card conversation at this point in time with the New York Clinic uh, to attempt to modify it? Michael, this is where we cue in. Womp, womp, womp. Nope. He actually never even brought it up because... He didn't really want to rock the boat with his first employer. Oh, no. The avoidance strategy. Mm-hmm. That's that's not – when you're talking about hard conversations, usually not going to work out well. Um, this is much different than how Dr. Roger handled his mm-hmm. hard conversation moment in last week's episode. That's right. So Dr. Homecoming moved to Long Island and signed the agreement with this comprehensive non-compete uh, that covered a 10-mile radius of every clinic, every – ASC and hospital that the New York clinic provides medical services. Is that right? You were paying attention. So I guess you are three for three today, Michael. Congratulations. Yeah. Your new high score. Yes. And the New York clinic actually told in the same letter, they plan on forcing the non-compete. Ooh. My client um, was the sole breadwinner for the family. 
his wife was helping take care of um, her elderly mother that lived in the neighborhood, which is, again, why they moved there. And he was now faced with needing to basically drive to the west side of New York, which is apparently uh, those in the New York area are already saying, screaming, oh, God, no. Um, that's that's know. almost impossible because the, the, the way this clinic was is basically covering so much dirt and so much territory. Or maybe even tr- he was thinking about moving to the other side of New York. But then they were trying to figure out what to do with the mother-in-law because now she was, you know, this stuff. And and no matter what, it, it, he would because he was basically blocked out of Long Island, he had to restart somewhere else. Oh man, that's that's a sad ending to the non-hard conversation, the, um, the avoided strategy. Yes, yes. Let's let's go to break and talk about some lessons to be learned from Doctor Homecoming, and I will. Be curious to hear ultimately what happened to him. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to Legal 123s with Birdadato. I'm your host, Brad Adato, with my co-host, Michael Bird. Now, Michael, this season, our theme is hard conversations. And Dr. Homecoming avoidance strategy of, of, of not having the hard con- conversation on the front end really bit him in the... No, don't, Brad. Just keep it, keep it clean. Oh. We don't want to get that E rating next to it. We all know what you're about to say, but you don't have to say it. Okay, we're all thinking it. Got it. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's let's just briefly recap the chain of events. Doctor Homecoming, like Doctor Roger, was moving home. That was part of his plan A, and uh, and he does the right thing. I mean. Almost. He should have called me instead of you, but he did call <laughs> one of us. So that hold on, good. strike that. No. Yeah. Now, now I'm seeing a new pattern, Brad, with these two stories. Um, and and you gave him good advice. Told him here's the things can, that. Can you say that again? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, it crackled. Uh, you <laughs> gave him good advice. Told him what needed to be done, even though it was going to be hard, even though it was going to be awkward. That. Uh, but you got to deal with the fact that you are moving to Long Island and that you can't have this type of non-compete. And you've already said it once. He took the avoidance strategy. Who knows why? Mm-hmm. Didn't even tell you about it. You didn't even know until there's a problem. And then he gets basically fired. And here we are. And he they're saying they're going to enforce it. And he's blocked out of his hometown. Yeah. And I guess, you know, we can pick it up for there. But in situations like this, you know, you're getting this phone call, Brad, and and our job is not to be the I told you so person, mm-hmm. um, but to determine, you know, okay, well, here's this is where we are now. Um, here's the situation and how can we best assist Dr. Homecoming to, you know, get the best possible outcome, even if we're choosing between some really poor choices yeah um so let's take a step back and um and let's talk a little bit about restrictive covenants and kind of how that you know how why those factor into this yeah and you know in the beginning of this we we were throwing out all these terms and as as it relates to uh, non-competes but you know there are lots of different types of restrictive covenants and the one that most people are are aware of is 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 the non-compete obviously there's non-solicitation other confidential stuff but a non-compete clause is part of a contract that is designed really to bar an individual from working for competing, in this case, medical practice, for a set period of time in a designated geographic area. And if you have a non-compete clause in your contract um, and you choose to leave that medical practice, they theoretically um, – they could subject you to some type of legal action and prevent you from working for another practice during that agreed upon time and geographic area. Well, but Brad, I heard that states don't allow non-competes for medical providers. So that's not enforceable. Well, um, good old 
locker room talk that we hear from our, our doctors. And um, if for those who've listened to our, our red flag seasons, they may have heard the answer to this one. But yes, Michael, that is said a lot. That is not always true. So first, be careful. It's just because you don't have a non-competing agreement doesn't mean you don't have other some type of other restricted covenant, like I said earlier, like non-solicitations or non-disclosures. The details in these sections, it does matter. In reality, though, the non-compete clauses or non-complete agreements are somewhat difficult to enforce to the fullest extent by because courts and states tend to be very reluctant to prevent people from working, right? They don't want that to happen. But if the state does allow it, does allow that non-compete or non-compete covenant in that sense, make sure you understand the essential elements. And Michael, that typically in a non-compete, it must be reasonable in time, geographic scope, and the description of the actual activity. Yeah, and and as we've discussed in other shows and even kind of alluded to here, I'll drive the the point home. Non-competes are state-driven. Right. So, for example, in a state like California, a non-compete is unenforceable by law. Mm-hmm. While in Texas, you can enforce a non-compete a non-compete against a physician, but there's strings attached yep. and they actually have to have a, this buyout type clause that we actually alluded to or spoke about a little earlier in the show. Um but finally, you know, you have a state like New York and, and non-competes are permitted if the agreement meets the elements that you've, you mentioned above with the, the time, geographic scope and activity being reasonable. Yeah. And I want to add something real quick. You just said about the buyout. In some states, it's required to, for it to be, for it to be enforceable. You have to have the buyout. And you, you brought a great point up earlier, which is that doesn't mean the parties can't agree otherwise to have a buyout in right. the agreement. So don't get the state law. Uh, issue versus Michael's recommendation and the negotiations confused. Right. Some states do require it. But in the fa- past few years, what, one something we've noticed that is that more states um, have really felt – have been acting more hostile towards non-compete clauses in general and inside of employment agreements or just an example or just in general. And an example that uh, what we've been looking at is in Massachusetts recently, the legislation played a major part and really moving forward to saying we don't like non-competes a lot <laughs> and we're going to restrict it. And so what happened is that the state adopted this law called the Massachusetts Non-Competition Act. And in this – what this act says basically it Massachusetts employers must now meet several requirements for a non-compete even to be valid and enforceable. Some of these things can be as simple as that person has a right to consult an attorney or, or they're given 10 days before the, the actual agreement is actually effective. Um, it has to be supported by some fair and reasonable considerations um, and independent of the act continued employment. Um, it has to be legitimate business interest as to why they're doing it. And finally, um, they have a garden leave provision um, that has to be inside the non-compete agreement. Well, I want to get to that garden leave, but – you're licensed in Massachusetts, right there, right, Brad? That's they tell everybody. Yeah. So this Massachusetts Non Competition Act is called the MNCA. Yeah. I expect you to have that tattooed on your neck or your shoulder. It's on my bicep. Fair. Okay. Okay, that's acceptable. Now let's get back to the garden leaf. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a lot of kind of legal roadblocks and legal words that you just mentioned. But I'm curious. You don't hear the garden leave clause a lot historically. What, yes. does that, what does that mean? Yeah, typically garden leave and law don't seem to go together because most times lawyers are not practicing the dirt. But glad you asked. A garden leave clause is really what it says. It's a provision really requiring an, an employer to pay an employee post-employment during that same restrictive time um, – to keep paying them if they're trying to keep the non-compete clause in force. So an example is someone leaves and you say, great, I'm going to enforce the non-compete, but now I have to continue to pay you. And so basically you're telling someone they can go home and work from home and I guess play in their garden and, and work in their garden or nowadays maybe play video games, whatever it is. But this garden leave basically says that the requirement is the employer must pay during this provision at least 50% of the highest annual salary on a pro day basis during the entire restricted period. So again, let's use an example. If someone was getting paid at the height $100,000 um, and you want to enforce it for 12 months, you now have to pay this person out $50,000 to keep them from actually competing against you. And so now as an employer, you have to make a decision. How much do you want to enforce this non-compete? Because now i got to pay somebody their salary or at least 50% of their salary during that time frame 
to compete, so they won't compete with me. And other states have started to pay attention. Colorado, Illinois, Oregon, all these states have developed somewhat restrictive non-compete laws. I do think it should be called video game leave instead of garden, <laughs> garden leave. That's very old school. Yes. Okay. Well, another common issue that can trip up a non-compete it, 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 that if it's not done correctly is there's this legal concept, Brad, that in uh, in some states, actually in most states, that the employee must be given some form of adequate consideration in return for a non-compete. Ooh, that's a fancy word. I don't even know if that's a vocabulary word of the day because I feel like we've had a, a lot thrown around. But what do you? What does that mean for our audience? Well, all the lawyers out there just had PTSD from law school when they heard consideration <laughs> from contracts law. Yes. Uh, it basically means that the employer must give the employee something in return for signing the non-compete. Now, in some states, it's just – you give them a job. Oh, yay. And so you, because you give them a job, they will have to sign the non-compete. But other states require something more than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that you have to give them, maybe it's cash or more commonly, you know, a access to what they call confidential information, which is, you know, the secret sauce of the company. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're disclosing to them as part of their job, the secrets of the business. And so you can't, that justifies you restricting them from taking that information, going across the street and competing with them. That's right. So now that we're, we're kind of diving deeper into this non-compete talk, once um, we have this conversation of let's go in towards the enforceability side um, and a risk associated with that non-compete. For example, we've seen a ton of, of employment agreements where as written, the non-compete is unenforceable on its face by law. But what does that mean to – the employee. Yeah, I mean, the enforcement, it, you're, you have to go to court and there's a cost element we can talk about as well. But the just from a purely law perspective, uh, you have two competing forces at, at play. Number one is you, you have statutory and appellate kind of case law that will tell you, uh, you know, where, how you stand. And a lot of times that stuff is very pro employer if it's a state that allows non competes. Mm -hmm. And even in those states, the competing force is that the trial courts tend to disfavor these non competes. They want people to be able to work. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is you have a whole lot of uncertainty if you want to get into a, a fight over a non compete. And so it creates some really uncomfortable moments when you're trying to make some decisions uh, like we were facing here with Dr. Homecoming because, um, you know, it's a pretty unenforceable looking contract, but there's a lot of uncertainty that would go with going down that path of litigating. Yeah. And, you know, in considering this case, um, you know, we have this very large geographic area and the conversation I ended up having with Dr. Homecoming was, um, you know, he's like, I've only been there for 10 months and I've only seen patients at a few clinics and not that many hospitals. And he really wanted to say, look, I was really just working basically at two clinics and did surgeries at just two hospitals. But the contract as written, the restriction was where it, it, it was there was no restriction. I mean, it wasn't like that's that would work because that, in his mind, all those other places, maybe he went one day in that 10 months or maybe discharge one patient in 10 months. And and. So we did discuss hiring a New York litigation counsel to help fight the group. But again, he was a sole breadwinner. He's only been really been making money for 10 months at this point because he's just out of his fellowship. And he didn't think he could afford the fight uh, to figure out if he could reduce the non-compete scope. And especially since in this case, the group was an 800 pound gorilla in the area. Yeah. I mean, that gets to, you know, kind of jumping back, Brad, I talked about uncertainty and then that that factor that he said that he only actually worked at a couple locations mm -hmm. is really important and a really good piece of evidence if he were to to fight this. Uh, but in reality, he's this eight hundred pound gorilla is a huge issue because that for that creates another level of risk, and that is the cost to defend these cases. Mm -hmm. um, if if he were to just compete and get sued, uh, or even take it the other way, he was to sue to try to get a declaration that it was unenforceable, mm -hmm. he's going to spend a significant amount of money in a, in a short amount of time just to, you know, find out if, 
he was, if he was okay and knowing that, uh, you know, that, that that's just to deal with this, this risk that we talked about before that was, that's uncertain. Yeah. And, and so because Dr. Homer, home, homecoming took the avoidance strategy, he was in a really bad position. He signed his contract, uh, didn't really have the financial ability to challenge this non-compete. Dr. Homecoming was desperate to stay, stay in this area, really wanted the group to waive all the non-competes in, in, since he was just there for 10 mo- months. And this is just – for audience members, there was multiple conversations I had with, the, the, with Dr. Homecoming, the New York Clinic's attorney going back and forth. And the group, the group just flat out said, no, we're enforcing the non-compete initially. We got a little bit more started having our hard conversations and more intense, and it got more painful, obviously, because now we're on the backside of of the agreement where we're trying to find some means. And eventually, we were able to carve out one hospital and one area that he he basically didn't do any work in it. And we had that one hospital and the one clinic removed from the list. So Dr. Homecoming could stay um, to open his own practice. Now, uh, you know, lucky for the group and somewhat what we eventually found out, they did feel a little bad that it didn't work out, but they still wanted to block him out of their major territories. So Dr. Homecoming was allowed to hang, stay with his family. However, he was still prohibited from joining any other group. So he Mm -hmm. could do his own shop. So again, basically he was starting over even though um, you know he got he got a win, but mm-hmm. he's started from scratch as an orthopedic surgeon is not an easy task. So, Michael, final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you can kind of connect uh, these hard conversations and whether you have them or not to the uh, landing on the moon shows that you started with. Doctor Roger had his hard conversation, and he was his experience, though bumpy, was more like the Tom Hanks narrated documentary of what happened because America landed on the moon first. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Homecoming was like, this is what happens when you don't have the hard conversation. Russia lands on the moon first and look at the series of unfortunate events that unfolded. <laughs> I love that tie-in, by the way. <laughs> All right, audience member, next Wednesday, no more contract talk. We'll have a hard conversation when cash versus compliance butts heads at the IV Therapy Bar. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, if you like this episode, please subscribe, make sure to give us a five-star rating, and share with your friends. You can also sign up for the Bertadotto newsletter by going to our website at bertadotto.com. Bertadotto is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadotto. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.